Colossians 1, verse 21. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. I want you again to turn your attention to verse 23. At the end of verse 23, Paul refers to himself specifically as a minister. And not just a general term, but when he says that he is a minister, he says, I became a minister of the hope of the gospel. This message that you heard, this message that was preached to every creature under heaven, I, Paul, also became a minister of this message of the gospel. When we hear the word minister, and we tend to think of someone who is full-time, someone who is employed by the church uh, to carry out some sort of specific role, right? He's a, he's a minister. We tend to think of a pastor, an evangelist, a preacher, a teacher. In fact, even when we ordain men, we ordain them into the gospel ministry. However, though that is certainly a category of ministers, and even Paul, Paul was many of those things I just mentioned, Paul was called into the ministry, so there is that category of ministry all the above mentioned things, all that work, that calling to ministry, it's not limited to just people who are called into full-time ministry. Every single believer is called. It's not for a select few in the church. Every single believer is called into the gospel ministry without any hesitation. I say that without any exception. The calling to come under the yoke of Christ, to labor with Christ, to labor for Christ in the gospel is extended to every true believer. If you are in Christ and Christ is in you, then you have been called to, you are in the gospel ministry. This calling to come under the yoke, it goes to every believer. And though we might not be called to the same kind of ministry Paul was called to, you might not be, came, be called to the same kind of vocational ministry that I'm called to. Every single one of us, man or woman, adult or child, every believer is called into the ministry in the same way that Paul was. Now, though it's true that everyone is not called to the same type of ministry, every believer is, of course, called to ministry. In the text we just read, Paul, whether intentionally or not, he really gives a synopsis of what the gospel ministry is, what its aim is, and, and how it's conducted. So he tells us what the gospel ministry is, what it does, and then what it's supposed to accomplish. The portion of Scripture we just read really can be divided into three categories. We're going to spend the next three weeks looking at these three categories. Number 1, verse 24 through verse 25, talks about the gospel ministry. Verse 26 through 27 talks about the gospel message. And verse 28 through 29 talks about the gospel method. So we're going to take these next three weeks, look at each one of these carefully, look at each one of these with consideration. And my hope is that on the other side of this kind of this mini-study, that you're better going to understand, that you're better going to be equipped to carry out your individual calling as a, a gospel minister. So number 1 today, we're going to look at the gospel ministry. And I think it's valuable for us to begin, when we talk about the gospel, it's really valuable for us to begin by defining exactly what is the gospel. Of course, the gospel is the good news. It's the message that God himself has come into the world. He's become one of us to redeem us. God became one of us to bear our sins. All of our sins were placed on Christ. Christ died for us, as us, on the cross. But not only did he die, he was buried and he rose again, thus signifying that God has fully accepted the payment for sin, that victory over sin, death, and hell have been accomplished. That's the gospel. So then, what is the gospel ministry? The gospel ministry is the proclamation of that hope. Notice verse 23, Paul mentions the hope of the gospel. 
The gospel ministry is proclaiming this message of Jesus. It's proclaiming hope amid hopelessness. I think we would all agree it it shouldn't really be any question. If you look at the world around you today, people are growing increasingly more and more hopeless. And the more things unfold around us, the more it looks like the culture is is hopeless. It looks like the government is hopeless. Everywhere you look, all you see is hopelessness. What the gospel ministry is, is stepping into that darkness and proclaiming the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Paul was not an advocate for political or social issues. You'll notice that Paul really didn't spend any time talking about politics. In fact, the only times he did, probably he said things that we don't like, like actually obey the government as so far as they obey God, right? Paul didn't talk a lot about politics. When Paul talked about social issues, he only talked about them really from the perspective of the heart. Paul wasn't a proclaimer of the latest trends. What Paul was was he was a preacher of the gospel and the hope that it offers. You see, the gospel alone offers hope both for now and for eternity. You know, people who focus only on social ills, the social gospel, the idea that it is our job to lift everyone out of their bad situations. And certainly, we want to help people. We want to see lives change. We want to see lives better. But this whole idea that it's all just about social justice or it's about social ideas or social ills. People who focus on those things only run the high risk of getting people more comfortable on their path to hell. If we're not careful, we can address all of these social issues and and really put springs on somebody's wagon, make their life so much more comfortable, but never address the fact that they are still destined to eternity without God. See, the gospel, though, doesn't just address social problems or political problems. The the gospel addresses all problems because all problems find their root in the existence of sin. And what the gospel is the proclamation of is that Jesus has come to deal and do away with sin. Paul lived in a corrupt culture, but he didn't run himself ragged trying to change the political landscape. And I'll I'll stop here just so you don't have to come to me later and, and ask me about this. I'm not saying that Christians should not vote. In fact, I think Christians should vote. Right? We should be good stewards of our citizenship. We should vote in line with the scriptures. That's not what I'm talking about. We should vote, but I don't think even as believers that our whole life, our whole heart, should be given to this political system. Because even if you get what you think to be the right party in office, that's not going to change the hearts of people. And Paul understood that. He understood that the gospel alone offers the hope of reconciliation to God. And it is even the gospel alone that offers the hope of reconciliation between man. We're looking everywhere trying to solve all of our race issues. And we're looking everywhere but the right place. And the right place is scripture. The gospel actually brings beings, human beings, back together. It doesn't just reconcile us to God. It reconciles us to one another. The gospel alone promises restoration to the broken world systems. The gospel alone is the the power of God and the salvation. And it is therefore to be the defining mark of our ministry. So what is gospel ministry? Gospel ministry is the proclamation of hope because of the good news of God's redemptive work in the world. The gospel ministry is simply the proclamation of Jesus. There are three characteristics of Paul's gospel ministry that I think would be helpful to us if if we give them some consideration. We look at Paul's gospel ministry, especially in in verse 24 and verse 25. There's three characteristics that rise out that that often mark effective gospel ministry. Number one, the first one, we don't want to hear this word, but it's a reality. The first mark is suffering. The first mark of the gospel ministry is suffering. Now, Paul actually addresses the source of his suffering Remember, Paul was very likely, as he's writing to the Colossians here, he's very likely writing from a Roman, uh, from a Roman jail. He's likely under house arrest or, or in jail. Paul's not exempt from pain. Rather, Paul's whole life, every time you find Paul, he's suffering. He's enduring hardship. He's going through pain. He's experiencing affliction. Everywhere Paul went, every city he arrived in, trouble was waiting for him when he got there. And somebody might think, look at Paul and say, was Paul just an unusually unlucky person? And the obvious answer to that is no. The ministry was the very source of Paul's suffering. Paul would not have suffered the way he did had he not served the way he did. The ministry was the source of Paul's suffering, all the trouble he endured, everything he encountered. It was simply because he preached the gospel. If he would just have simply shut his mouth and quit preaching Jesus, all the trouble would have stopped. So even as he's writing here, he's in jail because he has preached Christ and him crucified. 
Notice in verse 24, Paul says, I feel up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. This is probably one of the most argued statements in the Bible. What exactly does this mean? What does Paul say when he says, I feel up the afflictions of Christ? Well, I can tell you, first of all, it doesn't mean that he was somehow perfecting the atonings of Christ's suffering. It's not that Christ, it's not that Paul, he said, I feel up like the sufferings of Christ in my flesh. Paul's not saying, I am perfecting Christ's atoning work, or I'm finishing what Christ did. Christ's redemptive work is fully complete. Scripture bears that out. We know that to be true. So, so what's Paul talking about? It doesn't mean that he, is, that he is necessarily perfecting the atoning suffering of Christ. What it does mean is that he was participating in the sufferings of Christ. I read one commentator that put it this way this week, and I thought it was a great illustration. When Christ ascended to heaven, you know, the whole time he was on earth, the, the, the Jews were seeking to do damage to him, seeking to hurt him, seeking to afflict him, even to the point they crucified him. Well, when he ascended back to heaven and they could no longer reach out and grab hold of him and hurt him, afflict him, the next best thing was to reach out and to grab his people. So God's people began to suffer in Christ's stead, if you will. Paul here, when he says, I feel up in my body, this is literal physical suffering. Paul is saying, basically, I am suffering on Christ's behalf. They are persecuting me as if they were directly persecuting him. Just as Christ suffered bodily at the hands of sinners, so Paul, who is his messenger, is also suffering in the flesh on Christ's behalf. So the, 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 the source of his suffering is the ministry. Suffering is a characteristic of gospel ministry. If the world hated Jesus, it's going to hate us if we're truly following him. There is no way around suffering for the sake of Jesus if you're actually following Jesus. He is a complete contradiction. Everything he did, everything he said, everything he was is a complete contradiction to the darkness. And if they hated him, there's going to hate, they're going to hate us if we are walking in the light with him. If they spit on him, they're probably going to spit on us. A partnership with Christ will always be a partnership with suffering, whether in a minor way or a major way in this life. So the source of his suffering was the ministry. But look at the sake of his suffering. Why endure it? Why tolerate such hostility? Why go through the pain, Paul? And of course, the chief answer that Paul would say is for the sake of Christ. Christ suffered for me. How can I not suffer for him? But in the context that we're looking at, Paul is enduring this contradiction of sinners. He says in verse 24, for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul understood that his suffering was not just for him. It was for them. Now, often when we suffer, we try to think, okay, what is God trying to teach me? What's God trying to do in me? And that's certainly relevant. That's something we should be looking at. But there's another side to it. It's not just what is God trying to do in me. The other side of the question is what is God trying to do through me? You see, Paul's suffering was not just for him. It was for them. Just as Christ has done, Paul was joining with Christ and suffering for the church, the ecclesia, the called out, the assembly, the body of Christ. This is so important to understand. And I think this might be, if, if you don't take anything away, I think this will be so important to take away. Paul viewed his suffering as a part, not as a hindrance of his ministry. Paul viewed his pain as a part of his ministry, not a hindrance to his ministry. Have you ever thought to yourself, well, if I could just get over this, or if I just didn't deal with this, I could be so much more effective for Christ. Has it ever dawned on you that maybe God has given you that or God has given you this so that you can be effective for Christ? Suffering actually positioned Paul to reach otherwise unreachable souls. You remember in his letter to the Philippians, Paul says, look, I want you to know, brethren, that these things which have happened to me, they've actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So Paul is literally, when he wrote this, he is chained to a Roman soldier. He's chained to a member of the Imperial Guard he, he can't go where he wants, do as he pleases. Literally 24 hours a day, the soldier is chained to him. And Paul says this actually happened for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. The scripture talks about that the, the gospel actually through the praetorian guard went into the palace. 
Paul could have never taken the gospel into Caesar's palace. But here he is chained to the Praetorian Guard, which was basically the, the chief armor, if you will, the chief bodyguards of Caesar. He's chained to one of these men 24 hours a day as they rotate in and out. He's speaking the gospel. He's writing the gospel. They're hearing the gospel. They're coming to believe in Christ. And then they're taking the gospel back into, back into Caesar's palace. Paul understood that his suffering able, enabled him to reach otherwise unreachable people. It was through the chain that Paul was able to communicate the gospel into the palace, not through his own voice, but through the voice of those that he, that he influenced and that he ministered to, and then they took it there. You see, suffering may be meant for the sake of a soul that you would not otherwise encounter. Maybe the reason you're at the hospital is not so much for you. It's God has placed you there. God has allowed you to have cancer or God has allowed you to have some heart issue or some eye issue or some other ailment. God has allowed that in your life because that is the only thing that would get you to the hospital. And there's somebody at the hospital that needs to hear the good news of Jesus. You see, suffering may be meant for the sake of a soul that you would not otherwise counter. Why, why was Paul so willing to deal with this suffering? Because he knew it was for someone else's sake. Suffering pierces the hearts of those who observe. Think about people as they watch someone else. I'm talking about unbelievers. As they watch you suffer and you suffer unjustly maybe. Or you suffer... Uh, and you suffer even with joy in the middle of your suffering. When they watch that, when that see, when they see that, it bursts something inside them that makes them wonder: How can you carry on the way you do? When I was in college, I worked for a, a company, and basically we were telemarketers. I was that guy that called your house that you hung up on, and uh, shame on you. <laughs> I hated that job. I mean, I absolutely hated it. It came up, though, that we were going to be forced to sell some things that I just, as a believer, I could not sell it. And I went to the manager and I said, I can't sell it. So there were all these other things that we could have sold, all these other things we did sell, and they wouldn't make accommodations. It was either you sell that or you lose your job. And, and not, honestly, it wasn't like I was suffering in this case because I was happy to lose that job. <laughs> so I said, I lose the job. As I was getting my stuff together to walk out, there was a lady there, and, and she did not live the same kind of lifestyle that she was not a believer. Uh, she, she was a homosexual. We had never really had any conversations. In fact, she had always just steered so far clear of me. But an interesting thing happened. As I was walking out, she grabbed me, and she was crying. And she said, what they're doing to you is not right. She said, you, you could sue them on religious grounds. And all that was true. But I had an opportunity. And really, I could have sued them on religious grounds because I was literally being let go for a religious reason. But I had an opportunity right then to, to share the gospel with her, and I, I've never seen her again. I don't know what happened in her life. But she stood there and wept. This was someone who has always been so hard, but she stood there and wept because she saw the way that I was going through, the way I was carrying myself when I was enduring hardship as a good soldier, when I was suffering reproach for the name of Jesus. You see, when other people see you suffer, especially when it's righteous suffering, it does something in their heart. And it makes the message even more powerful. It makes the message more provocative to the hearers. There's something heart-piercing about watching a man suffer for what he believes in. It, it puts his conviction on the center stage. When a man will literally lose his life for the sake of the gospel, it makes people start thinking, what is so marvelous? What is so attractive about this message that he would literally die for it? Suffering puts our beliefs on center stage. And it, not just us. It doesn't put us on center stage, but it puts what we are so faithful, so loyal to, the gospel on center stage. Suffering puts the gospel in a position where it has to be reckoned with. The light of Paul's hope shone the brightest in the darkness of the hopeless circumstances in which he found himself. I mean, Paul is, is under house arrest or even maybe possibly in a prison. We don't know exactly which state he was in when he wrote this letter. But, but his life is a mess from the outside. People would say his life is shipwrecked. And Paul is just as happy as he can be. It was the light of his hope that shone in the brightness, the brightness shone in the darkness. The true sweetness of the gospel was made manifest through the bitterness of the life he endured. It's one thing for you to tell people that Jesus is, that satisfies me, that Jesus is sweet to me. It's another thing for them to see it to be true when your life is bitter. Suffering provided for Paul a unique opportunity for displaying the hope of the gospel. 
And certainly God uses our suffering for our sake, but he also uses it to show his grace, to show his glory to those who do not yet know him through our satisfaction and sorrow. They stand back as we joyfully endure suffering for his name. They step back and they just say, what, what is it? What is it to this thing called the gospel? And it causes them to look in. Not only though does suffering pierce the hearts of those who observe, suffering also provokes courage in the church. When we suffer for Christ and we suffer well, it encourages the church. Uh, there was a man, I think it was around 1550, 1500, somewhere in there, a man by the name of Thomas Hawkes, H-A-U-K-E-S, if you want to read more about it later, uh, was martyred. He was burnt to death simply for his faith in Christ. He had made an agreement with some of his fellow believers before he went to the state. They had asked him, will you give us a sign that it's bearable, that it's endurable? Because many of them knew they were facing the same, uh, the same outcome. So they had come up with this sign that he would raise his hand, and raise three fingers. If, if it was bearable, if it was endurable, as he was suffering in those flames, he would raise his hand and raise three fingers to let them know the grace of God really is sufficient. It's okay, you can do this. They took him to the stake. They lit the, the pile on fire and... As he burned up, literally his, his skin was dried out. He became nothing but a charred mass of, of ash and flesh. The people looking on thought he had died. They thought it was all over. People actually started to leave. And eyewitnesses account that as they thought he was dead, that he raised not one hand or not three fingers. He raised both hands up in the air as high as he could and clapped together three times. And then he died. And what that did in those watching, it put, even it sends a chill up your spine as I say that, it put a courage in them that the grace of God will be sufficient in the day of trouble. When we endure suffering as good soldiers, when we endure suffering for the sake of the gospel ministry, what it does is it awakens courage in other believers. There are few things that encourage the body more than to watch a brother experience the sufficiency of God's grace and suffering. We see them go through it and it encourages us. It emboldens us to think, I can do it too. See, it doesn't just encourage the church, it emboldens the church. In that same text where Paul said, talked about the gospel going into, into the whole uh, uh, imperial household. Paul said in the next verse, Philippians 1, 14, 14, most of the brethren in the Lord, after I've gone through this, he said, most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So in other words, because of my suffering, it has actually not only encouraged, but it has emboldened other believers to take the gospel even further. Watching others endure suffering emboldens us to go further, to take our gospel ministry more seriously, to speak the gospel more accurately. Paul suffered for those who had been called out for those who were yet to be called in. Paul suffered for the church just as Christ had done for him. He was willing to suffer because he knew it was for their sake. Thirdly, though, there is the sweetness of his suffering that I want to point out. He says, look at verse 24. Now, this is a hard statement. Paul says, I am happy, I am delighted, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. How could someone say, I am, I am in so much pain and I'm just so happy about it? That's basically what Paul says here. How can he say, I delight, I delight in the devastation of my body? How can he say that? Because he understood what we just said, that his suffering was for their sake. He knew that his suffering would produce in them, by the work of the Holy Spirit, something that would be holy, something that would be lasting, something that would be good and eternal. So Paul could say, because I know that my suffering is for your sake, Paul could say, I delight in the devastation of my own body because I know it will work in you some eternal weight of glory. Because he knew this. He delighted in his suffering, not because of the pain, but in spite of the pain. Because he knew the Holy Spirit was going to produce something magnificent through it. Paul actually said that there is a sweetness to my suffering. I am in so much pain and I am just so happy about it. The gospel ministry will often be accompanied by suffering. And that suffering, though severe, may be sweet because we know it will be used by God to deepen our fellowship with Christ and to direct others to Christ. Suffering provides one of the greatest opportunities in life. And suffering will open more doors for gospel ministry than almost anything else. So therefore, we can say with Paul, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that this is for the body, for the body's sake, the church. The first mark 
of a gospel ministry is often going to be suffering, but there can even be sweetness in suffering because we know it's for the sake of the church. The next two points will be much quicker. The second mark of the gospel ministry is service. Look again. Verse 24, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of the body, which is the church, of which, of the church, he's speaking, of which I became a minister. The word minister here, it might surprise you, is the word diakonos. Okay, now some of you know exactly what that word is. That's the word we get the word deacon from. So Paul is not saying here that I am a deacon of the church. He did not hold the office of a deacon. The word diakonos literally means an attendant or a waiter. So what Paul is saying here is that I am a servant, I am a waiter to God's church. That is the calling I've received. Paul made the glory of the gospel. Now notice this. Say, how in my life can I make the gospel glorious? Uh, how can I make it evident that it is a wonderful thing? Paul made the glory of the gospel evident in adopting a servant role. The transforming power of the gospel is seen not when a man ascends, but when a man descends. In this world, we are told, climb the ladder, climb the ladder. It doesn't matter who you have to go over, climb the ladder. But the gospel calls us to get on our knees. The gospel calls us to wash feet. The gospel calls us to help the least of these. And, and it shows the transforming power of the gospel is shown when we start living our lives different. And instead of trying to climb the ladder, we get down at the bottom of the ladder and bandage up those who have been ran over as everyone else climbed. The gospel so radically transformed Paul's life. He went from being a rising star in Israel to one of the Mediterranean's most hated figures. Now, Saul never intended to live Paul's life, obviously. Some have conjectured that before his conversion, some would say that Paul may have even been being groomed to be the high priest. Some would say, well, that could be possible because he was of the tribe of Benjamin, not of the tribe of Judah. But at this time, the priesthood had basically become an appointed political office, so it's, it's a possibility. Either way, he trained at the feet of Gamaliel. He was one of the, the leading men in Israel at this point. His pedigree was impeccable. His credentials were impressive. His lifestyle was impregnable. Literally, Paul had a bright future ahead of him until he was overcome by the brightness of the glory on the road to Damascus. Maybe as Paul is writing this letter to the Colossians, maybe he's reflecting on his own conversion. Maybe he's thinking back to what he used to be, how he used to aim his life. Paul's encounter with the gospel had changed his life, his course, and his destiny so that he became, uh, even though he used to be a sought-after leader, now he has become a servant. One may ask, how does service reflect the gospel? It's when we serve that we are most like Christ and most unlike ourselves. What comes more natural to you, to serve or to be served? For most of us, it comes natural to be served. If we are most unlike ourselves when we get our knees and we serve other people, that's when we're most like Christ. Our service to God first and to each other is a powerful testimony of the hope of the gospel. When others look from the outside and say, why do you treat each other the way you do? Why do you serve each other the way you do? Whether it's in your marriage and in your friendships or, or just the church in general. When they look at us and say, why are you the way you are? Our answer can be the gospel has changed the way I live life. It's changed the way I look at life. I'm not climbing the ladder now. I'm just trying to help everyone who's been hurt by the ladder. <coughs> See, when we serve, it proves that we are living for another world. We're willing to be servants here because we're confident that we're going to be kings there. We're willing to live with less here because we know we're going to one day have more. We're willing to serve rather than be served. Through service, we contradict the world system and we confirm the hope of the gospel. We proclaim the gospel through service. In verse 25, Paul doesn't just say, of which I became a minister. He says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you. The word stewardship here refers to a servant who is given charge over the house. The steward was the administrator of the house who literally had all the affairs of the master under his belt, in his hands. The master entrusted him to, to carry out his business so that he could give his attention to other, in other places. Paul says when he thinks about his ministry and his service, he says that it has been given to me as a stewardship from God. 
Paul doesn't view this gospel ministry as something to, that belongs to him. He views himself as a servant. His calling has been granted to him by the master. Paul understands, look, I am, the, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. This is my calling, but it's not something I took for myself. It's something that God chose for me. I didn't choose it. God chose me for it. It has been given to me. It's been granted to me. And Paul was amazed when he thought about this ministry. He was amazed that God would convey on him such a high honor. In fact, when Paul was writing to Timothy, Paul said to Timothy, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly, I used to be a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was an insolent man. I was there when they stoned Stephen. I held their coats. He said, but I obtained mercy from God because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus towards me. Paul says, look, this is what I used to be. But God, who is so rich in mercy, has, took and, has taken someone like me. And he's not only redeemed me, but he has placed me in the gospel ministry. When Paul looks at the ministry, it's not something that he is proud of in himself because he knows in himself he would have no part in it. It's the grace of God that's brought him into this ministry. Therefore, knowing that it's a stewardship, knowing it's been given to him, then service is not beyond him. This privilege, obligation was the, the driving force of his life. It was not something he chose, something he was chosen for. It was like money placed in the hand of a servant. He felt a great obligation for the investment God had given to him. This is a good time to consider when you think about the gospel ministry, when you think about your own ministry, how do you regularly view yourself as God's ministry? Do you think of the work God has given you as a stewardship, something that you have been granted by grace to carry out for God? Or, or do you view this as an obligation, something I have to do? See, the reason Paul saw it as a stewardship was because he under, understood how unworthy he was to be brought into this hope, to be given this hope. And then not only to be given this hope, but to be granted to speak it to others. When, when you think about the ministry, do you delight that you get to be part or is it a drudgery that you have to be part? Do you think of the ministry as yours to do with as you please or is it something God has put in your hand, and something God has granted to you for the sake of kingdom affairs? Service was a clear mark of Paul's gospel ministry. It was a defining mark of Jesus' ministry, so it should be of ours as well. Number three, finally this morning. So Paul's, uh, one of the clear marks of his ministry, his gospel ministry, was that he was suffering. The second clear mark was service. There's a third clear mark, and I'm very briefly going to touch on this. The third clear mark of Paul's gospel ministry is that it was always very specific. One of the chief characteristics of Paul's ministry that made it most successful was that it was targeted. Paul knew who and what he was called to. Now, I think this is one of the most important discoveries that we individually have to make as believers if we want to be effective. Some of us have this bad habit of bouncing from ministry to ministry to ministry, from, from thing to thing to thing, just all over the place, never really settling down anywhere and saying, this is where God's called me, this is what I'm made to do, this is what I'm supposed to do. The effective farmer is not the one who dreams of owning the whole county and planting the whole county. The effective farmer is the one who cultivates, sows, and weeds a single tract of land. You can take somebody who has big dreams. They're going to own the whole county one day. They're going to have acres and acres and acres of land. And that person never gets anything done. But you take somebody with a half acre of land who, pl who plows, who plants, who, who plucks, who harvests, who actually gives attention to his land, the man who has much less land will, will actually accomplish much more than the man who just has big dreams. Paul says of his ministry, he says that this ministry, in verse 25, was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Paul understood what, who, where, why he was called. But there's... there's uh, an indication of he understood who he was called to because he says, this stewardship was given to me for you. Of course, specifically, he's writing to a group of Colossian believers. Generally, though, Paul is writing to Gentiles here. Paul knew quite well that his was the calling to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He said in verse 27 that God has willed to make the mystery known among the Gentiles, and he's chosen me to be the one to make that mystery known. 
In Galatians 1.15, Paul said, It pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. It had become very clear to Paul that his calling, his role in the ministry was to preach to the Gentiles. Notice Paul didn't choose his field. It was willed to him by God. It was God who made him an administrator of this particular task. One of the greatest discoveries you will ever make as a believer is where you fit in God's kingdom. You know, if you examine Paul's three missionary journeys, it would appear that he traveled the world, wouldn't it? I mean, he was all the time going. But if you took a picture of Paul's travels and you laid them over top of a world map, you will find that the area in which Paul ministered is actually extremely, extremely small. Basically, Paul ministered on the Mediterranean rim. And not even, not even all of it. He never went further north or further west than Rome. He never went further south than Jerusalem or further east than Damascus. In fact, the one time when he tried to go further east, God stopped him. God said no. We think about Paul's ministry, this man that was always traveling, always getting something done. But if you actually take Paul's travels and you lay it over the world map, I'd be surprised if, if all of Paul's travels probably didn't fit in, in an average American state. You see, Paul did not save the world. Paul brought a few men to Christ in a few cities across the Mediterranean. Yet it was these few seeds that continued to spring up into a worldwide harvest. It was his correspondence with with these few cities, these few believers that, that makes up much of our New Testament. What I'm trying to get you to see is that Paul accomplished more by planting one field, by allowing the Holy Spirit, discerning the specific will of God for the ministry he was called to, by allowing the Holy Spirit to show him. Paul accomplished more by planting one field than he would have had he ran all over the ancient world haphazardly broadcasting handfuls of seed. What I'm trying to get across to you is that, look, you do not have to save the world. That's God's job. But you do have a commission in the little area where you are and in serving well in the little area that you are in taking the specific role that God has given you, the specific track of land, whether it be your job, your family, your community, by serving well in the specific ministry that God has given you, you can reach the world from your little area. More can be done in ministry by finding where you belong than can be done in following every wind that blows you have to settle in your own heart or you're always going to be looking for another field to plant. You're, always, you're never going to hold the field you have until you have settled in your heart. This is where God has me and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Paul's ministry, why was Paul's ministry so effective? It was so effective because it was so specific. He didn't conquer the world. He did, though, impact the area he was assigned and through impacting the area he was assigned, he actually changed the world and continues to do it today. He knew what God called him to, and he committed his life to it. He not only knew the who, though, he knew the what. He said, my stewardship was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now, I'm going to stop here today. We'll pick up here next week. But just allows me to close by pointing out, Paul not only knew where God had called him to, he knew what God had called him to. His specific role, he was called to the Gentiles. His specific role among the Gentiles was to fulfill or to make the word of God fully known among the Gentiles. So I close with this. It's not only important that we know to whom or to where whom we are to whom or where we're called. It's important that we learn what we are to do and how we are to do it while we're there. It's important that we let the Holy Spirit, when we talk about this idea of gospel ministry, it's important that we let the Holy Spirit make it very clear to us, this is how you carry out your individual ministry. We don't look at what everybody else is doing. This is really a, a, a downfall in churches. We tend to look at a church and we think that church is being successful, that church is doing well, so we all do exactly what they're doing. You'll even notice when it comes to church decor today, everybody models right after the biggest, the fastest growing church. When it comes to the way the pastor looks, everybody tries to look like him. And all that's all that is superficial, all that's pragmatic. Our role is to say, okay, God, this is where you call me to. Now, how specifically do you want me to do what you call me to here? What's effective in one place won't necessarily be effective somewhere else. It's not only important to know who, to whom, or to where we've been called. It's important that we learn, that we ask God to show us how we're to do what we're to do while we're there. It's important that we find out what has God made me for, who am I in Christ, what gifts has he given me that he wants me to use where he's placed me.
We are every one of us called to the gospel ministry. Really, the question for you is this morning, what, or maybe I should say how, have you been equipped to carry out your calling? Let me say this. Find the how, and you will likely discover the what. What I mean by that, look into your life. Look at what God has done in your life. Look at how God shaped you. Look at how God's gifted you. The way God's gifted you, the experiences God has given you, probably gives you a good indication of where you're called and where you should fit in the ministry. I want to stop.